Welcome to Coffee with the Clergy. So you'll notice I have my face mask on. I uh, saw a recent study that said that uh, COVID-19 can be transmitted through video. So I figured I better wear this for, the, uh, for Coffee with the Clergy here. Okay, just kidding, just kidding. Uh, but it kind of seems like we should be hearing things like that, right? You, you expect me to turn on the news, you're going to hear some, some new crazy way that this virus transmits itself. And anyway, so a little fun there at the beginning. Uh, let's, let's, uh, before we go any farther, let's say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle on them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come to our final session on Space Salvi, on Christian Hope by Pope Benedict. Uh, it's going to be a good one. But it is always a little sad getting to the end of one of these things. I always, when I get to the end of a book, I, I oftentimes, especially if I enjoy the book, feel like I'm, I'm losing a friend. Uh, so maybe some of you have the same experience. But uh, so we're going to be diving into uh, this, this last section on purgatory. And um, you'll notice also, by the way, I forgot to mention, I am in my office. I figured maybe a change of scenery would be nice. Uh, plus this will dovetail perfectly from the intro. I actually have the same uh, pullover on here uh, just because the weather has been a little cold. So, so here we are. We, uh, we're in the context of this, this section where we're talking about the Last Judgment as well as now we're transitioning into Purgatory. And uh, Pope Benedict is exploring a very interesting theme here at the end of the letter because we usually think of hoping in God's mercy or hoping in God's grace, hoping for the forgiveness of our sins, hoping to you know, be in heaven. So why are we talking about justice and purgatory? Uh, but he, I mean, he's making a very interesting point here that that our hope is actually hope in justice as well, and that if it was all mercy, that really wouldn't be a very satisfying picture, would it? Uh, but in fact, it's because mercy and justice go together, uh, and they are, you know, um, meet their they have their perfect sort of synthesis and fulfillment in God. Uh, that's really what we hope in, and the last judgment is is part of how that justice of God is implemented. So um, he, he he has this section where he he, be, he begins to talk about uh, this this idea of purgatory, right? Uh, and so if we just take a moment to think about purgatory, you know, uh, this is often a very confusing uh, doctrine that we have, uh, you know, may, confusing because maybe. It's hard to understand, for one thing, or uh, a lot of other people don't believe in it, you know, Protestants especially. Uh, you know, Catholics haven't even really talked about it all that much in recent decades, um, as we've, you know, honestly, we tried to sort of de-emphasize in certain ways, certain very Catholic things, as a way of opening ourselves up to um, our brothers and sisters from the Protestant faiths coming back to the church, um, which, you know... Uh, that's been what it's been. So we sort of de-emphasized things like the Eucharist and Mary and and um, purgatory, these kinds of things for a while. And uh, now we've we've seen that it really didn't really bear fruit as as people might have hoped. And we're bringing these things back, uh, especially as um, we sort of I think as a church are sort of rediscovering the treasures of of, the, of our tradition, you know. So anyways, I actually hadn't planned to say any of that, but uh, hopefully that's, that's um, helpful. Um, so, um, so purgatory, right, purgatory. Eternity ultimately has two destinations, right, heaven and hell. So what's this purgatory thing doing? Uh, and what about limbo? That's another question we get. Uh, purgatory is a place where those who are on their way to heaven make a bit of a pit stop, and they do two things. These souls in purgatory do two things. They are, first of all, serving their punishment due injustice to the sins they've committed, right? The guilt of sin is, of course, forgiven through, uh, through the sacrament of reconciliation especially, but even through making a perfect act of charity and a perfect act of contrition, and even through you know, receiving the Eucharist when we're talking about venial sins, 
So the guilt of sin is removed, but there's still a punishment due in God's justice for the things that we've done. And so in, in, you know, the first part of what we're doing in purgatory is serving that time, that temporal punishment. Uh, the second thing is that the souls are being purified and they're being prepared to enter into the, the joy of heaven. And we'll come, about, come back around to some of these themes, uh, but just to have a, you know, a, a general understanding at the outset here, you know, purgatory is temporary. Ultimately, there's just heaven and hell, you know, but, uh, but up until the time when, you know, all the purgation, everything is done, there's this temporary state for those who are on their way. The people, the souls in purgatory, their salvation is, is, is a sure thing, right? There's no question about that. There's no question of earning their way into heaven. None of that's happening, right? All that happens in our life on earth. Um, so they are assured of their salvation, the souls in purgatory, but they're going through this process of, of, of sort of, you know, fulfilling that punishment and being purified. We don't like to talk about punishment very much, do we? It sounds, you know, it's, it sort of grates in our ears, you know, uh, but we'll, we'll kind of, we'll come back around and, you know, the Pope's perspective on this is very interesting. Um, so he starts out actually by, by pointing out the, the roots of this doctrine in Jewish teaching. And um, he's thinking here about the, or, or let me say, he's taking as a springboard the, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Often the rich man is just called by the name debase, which is the, the word in Latin for the rich man. Uh, so oftentimes you'll hear this parable called uh, Lazarus and debase. It's actually portrayed in one of our stained glass windows, the window on gluttony. Um, but um, so in that, in that parable, Lazarus, who suffers his whole life, right? He has nothing. Uh, he ends up in the afterlife being comforted in the bosom of Abraham, is what the parable says, while the rich man is tormented. He's sent to a place of torment, and there is a chasm, an impassable chasm separating the two places. Uh, but uh, Pope Benedict points out that what's referred to here is, is not the final judgment, but it's actually, um, he says, it's taking up a notion found in early Judaism namely that of an intermediate state between death and resurrection, a state in which the final sentence is yet to be pronounced. That's the end of paragraph 44. Let me read you the beginning of 45. This early Jewish idea of an intermediate state includes the view that these souls are not simply in a sort of temporary custody, but as the parable of the rich man illustrates, are already being punished or are experiencing a provisional form of bliss. There is also the idea that this state can involve purification and healing, which mature the soul for communion with God. The early church took up these concepts, and in the Western church, they gradually developed into the doctrine of purgatory. He says at this point that he doesn't intend to uh, trace the whole history of the doctrine of purgatory. But interesting to note those origins, that there were these concepts in early Judaism concepts that our Lord is even taking up into his parables, and these eventually develop into the doctrine of purgatory. Pope Benedict goes on, um, and he gives kind of a basic explanation for why we need this doctrine, you know. And this, I want to read this, I know I've, I've read a, a, a fairly long passage already, but I want to read this too, um, just because, you know, he's really, he expresses himself uh, so poignantly, so clearly here. So uh, this is, again, this is about halfway through paragraph 45. He says, There can be people who have totally destroyed their desire for truth and readiness to love, people for whom everything has become a lie, people who have lived for hatred and have suppressed all love within themselves. Speaking, of course, about uh, this life, right? So these people have, have pursued lives on earth that, that led to this situation, you know, where they've, as he says, totally destroyed their desire for truth and love. This is a terrifying thought, he says, but alarming profiles of this type can be seen in certain figures of our own history. In such people, all would be beyond remedy, 
and the destruction of good would be irrevocable. This is what we mean by the word hell. On the other hand, he says, there can be people who are utterly pure, completely permeated by God, and thus fully open to their neighbors, people for whom communion with God, even now, gives direction to their entire being, and whose journey toward God only brings to fulfillment what they already are. And this, of course, is the idea of, of heaven, right? So he's got, he sets up the, the two sort of extremes, right? People who, you know, are, are heading for hell, right? Um, C.S. Lewis actually develops this idea in a very striking way in, in a book called The Great Divorce. It's not divorce like in marriage. It's, it's the, the divorce that the title talks, to, or talks about is the separation between heaven and hell. But in, in, that, in that book, C.S. Lewis has this concept that, you know, when somebody gets to, to heaven or gets to hell, when they look back on their entire life, even their life on earth, everything will, will, you know, be revealed as hell or as heaven, you know. So it starts now in this life is what he's saying, you know. Uh, you know so the journey towards hell starts now, or the journey towards heaven starts now. Uh, it's, it's kind of up to us, right, to a certain extent. Um, and so, but notice the categories that Pope Benedict uses here. Uh, he's, he's talking about um, an openness to truth, a readiness to love, and, um, and an openness to God, right? So it's possible to pursue those things in this life, and it's possible also to reject those things. And that already is st starting to impact the soul. Remember, we talked about that last time, that these, these choices that we make, they have an impact on our souls, and that was even coming from Plato. Uh, so, um, but, but he goes on to say, this is interesting here, uh, he says, this is the beginning of paragraph 46, by the way, yet we know from experience that neither of these cases is normal in human life. So it's not normal to see either of these extremes. Either somebody who's completely destroyed their desire for truth and their readiness to love, their openness to God, right? Or on the other hand, it's, it's fairly uncommon uh, you know, to, to really to meet a true saint, right? Somebody who has done the opposite uh, and totally lived for God and, and other. Um, for the great majority of people, we may suppose, there remains in the depths of their being an ultimate interior openness to truth, to love, to God. In the concrete choices of life, however, it is covered uh, by ever new compromises with evil. Much filth covers purity, but the thirst for purity remains, and it is still, I'm sorry, and it still constantly reemerges from all that is base and remains present in the soul. What happens to such individuals when they appear before the judge? So we've got the extremes set up, and then, but for the, mo for the mo vast majority of people, we're in the middle somewhere. That desire is still there. We still make the attempt to seek truth, to try to love God and those around us, to be open to God in our lives. And yet we struggle, right? We, we fall into temptation. Uh, so we're sort of in the middle somewhere. And, and so what happens to these folks? I love this phrase that he uses here. He says, the thirst for purity remains. This is already hinting at an essential aspect of purgatory that really, in, in my opinion, makes it a beautiful doctrine. Uh, and it may be strange to describe it that way, but ultimately I do think it is a beautiful doctrine. Uh, there's, there is a thirst for purity in each one of us. And really, it's, it's that thirst that makes us want the purification, as painful as it may be. But we want to be purified before coming into uh, the joys of heaven to behold God face to face. We recognize our own need for that purification. And the idea is that when we come before the just judge, we will see that ever more clearly, and we will desire to be sort of cleaned up. My professor in, uh, at Notre Dame, I, I believe he's told this story actually during a class that I took on C.S. Lewis, um, but he gave this story. You know, he said, you know, imagine um, that, uh, you know, somebody goes through life, you know, they, at baptism they receive this white garment, but they go through life. Uh, they get it dirty, right? It gets stained, uh, and they appear finally before St. Peter at the pearly gates, let's say. And, you know, St. Peter says to somebody, let's just imagine, right? Uh, 
you know, look, you know, you, you, you're dirty. You, you probably need a bath and whatever, but it's okay. You know, we love you anyway. Come on in. If you were that person, wouldn't you, wouldn't you pause and say, you know, St. Peter, uh, if possible, I'd really like to be cleaned up before coming into God's house, you know. Uh, and that's, in, in essence, that's kind of what's happening in purgatory, right? Uh, we, see, we see our need for purification. We see the punishment due to the things that we've, those sins we've committed, and we desire it. And that's that, that purification that takes place. So, uh, that thirst for purity, I love that phrase, thirst for purity. There's, there's, there's in us a desire for that purification. And again, it's, it's really, it's, it's fulfilling the picture, right? It's filling out the picture. You know, pure mercy, pure grace isn't the whole picture. There, there is this aspect of justice that really makes it perfect and beautiful, uh, Again, you know, we had that, that concept earlier in, in the encyclical. You know, is it really satisfying to our sense of justice and even dignity that the murderer and his victim should sit side by side without distinction at the heavenly banquet, at least not without some sort of justice served first, you know? Um, so, and, and it's, it is, it's rather complicated, you know, because we do know that, I mean, forgiveness and mercy is all part of this equation, you know. But does that just make it all go away, you know? Forgive and forget, people say. But it's that forgetting part is, is more challenging than you might expect. And it's not actually an essential part of the forgiveness. Um, at this point, Pope Benedict brings in a, some scriptural foundation for this doctrine. And this is from the New Testament. Uh, he says here... Uh, He's quoting St. Paul. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. Paul says, Now if anyone builds on the foundation, the foundation which is Christ, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it. The day here that he seems to be referring to here is the day of judgment, the last day. In this edition, even they've capitalized the the D and day, uh, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Again, this is uh, of course a far cry from, you know, uh, yeah sort of a scholastic laying out of the doctrine of purgatory. But we see the roots of it there, right? St. Paul is talking about a process by which somebody does come to salvation where there's a purification first. The foundation of Christ was there in their life, and they built up with a, a mixture of materials. Some things they put up were like gold. Some of it was a bit more like straw, you know? And there's a purification that happens to reveal what is, uh, what is there, you know? And uh, so again, so some roots of the idea. Some of you are probably wondering about Second Maccabees. We're going to get there. Uh, at, at the beginning of paragraph 47, he brings in an interesting point here. Some recent theologians are of the opinion that the fire which both burns and saves is Christ himself, the judge and savior. I think it's important for us to hear those concepts together. Christ, not only as Savior, but also as judge. Again, we're, we're seeing the full picture here, right? It's not just mercy, not just grace, but it's justice and grace together. Th that should sound familiar from our last, our last um, episode. Uh, we began to look at that, that combination of things there and considering the last judgment. So to consider Christ as both Savior and Judge, it helps us combine, uh, to combine those concepts. And it, it even I, I should have um, I should have looked this up, but uh, one of the one of the options for the opening prayer of a funeral mass uh, brings brings out these these uh, themes very well. It's, it says uh, 
you know, that, that, this, that the person who, for whom we're celebrating the funeral, you know, so, so that name um, may find in Jesus, who was a merciful Savior, also a, a merciful judge. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful combination of these, these concepts, right? The full picture. Uh, it's at this point that Pope Benedict finally brings in 2 Maccabees, which is one of the classic uh, scripture passages that we turn to for the, for the foundation of this doctrine of purgatory. Because in, in 2 Maccabees, and again, Pope Benedict points out this is, this is witnessing to um, early Jewish thought, right? Uh, the 1st and 2nd Maccabees were, were written probably in <clears throat> the 1st or 2nd century before Christ. So before, you know, Christianity is even close to being on the scene, right? Uh, he says, early Jewish thought includes the idea that one can help the deceased in their intermediate state through prayer. This happens in 2nd Maccabees chapter 12, verses 38 to 45. There's a battle, and many of the uh, Jewish soldiers who, who have fallen during the battle are found to have idols on their persons. They have little you know, little wood statues or something that they're carrying in their, in their clothes, so they've committed a grave sin, right? They've committed an idolatry. And uh, the response of the leader of, of the, the battle uh, on the Jewish side is to say, we must pray and offer sacrifice for these men. But what would be the point of that, right, is the thought process. What would be the point of that if their, their you know, final destination, let's say, has already been determined, if their salvation has already been determined? But there's an idea that we can help them, that we can, that by our prayers, by offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass, that we can help the souls in purgatory. And Pope Benedict comes back around here to one of the classic themes that runs throughout this whole encyclical, which is... Uh, a sort of confronting the individualism that sneaks into our way of thinking so much. And uh, I want to read him directly here again because uh, he's so beautiful here. He says, a further question arises. So if, if purgatory is simply purification through fire in the encounter with the Lord, judge and savior, how can a third person intervene even if he or she is particularly close to the other? And he goes on to say, when we ask such a question, we should recall that no man is an island entire of itself. Our lives are involved with one another. Through innumerable interactions, they are linked together. No one lives alone. No one sins alone. No one is saved alone. The lives of others continually spill over into mine in what I think, say, do, and achieve. And conversely, my life spills over into that of others, for better or for worse. So my prayer for another is not something extraneous to that person, something external, not even after death. In the interconnectedness of being, my gratitude to the other, my prayer for him, can play a small part in his purification. Very beautiful, uh, very beautiful passage there. Again, calling us out of that individualism and helping us reflect on the fact that we are so connected to each other not only in this life, but even after this life, uh, that, that, of course, that connection continues. Um, you know, this makes me think of um, a movie called Interstellar, uh, one of my favorite recent movies. Uh, you know, it's about this, on the, on the surface, it's about this uh, journey through space, and they're trying to save the human race by finding a new home, and they're, so they're trying to, you know, go to a new star, right, Interstellar. Uh, so this journey and, and the expedition and everything seems to be what's interstellar, right? But by the end of the movie, what you see is that, you know, what is truly interstellar is the love that unites the characters. And it's very fascinating. In this movie that is so focused on scientific uh, truth, what we know about black holes and wormholes and this kind of stuff, and they're very much trying to get this accurate to what we know currently, um, in the midst of all of that, you know, there's this theme that comes to the fore, especially in a conversation in the middle of the movie, about really love being truly reliable and love being uh, a, a, a true um, foundation for making a decision. And um, so anyway, so again, it's, you know, it's that, that love, that interconnectedness of us all 
that reaches even throughout the stars, right? Even, you know, among the stars um, and beyond, right? To the to the immaterial realm. So that just about covers it. I wanted to just bring in one thing here. You know, Pope Benedict, um, he mentions a couple times, yeah, he says... It is clear that uh, we cannot calculate the duration of this transforming burning in terms of the chronological measurements of this world. So time in purgatory, right? How does that work? Um, and he says, you know, we, it's not, we can't really calculate it, right? I think what he has in the back of his mind here is this, this old concept, which often gets confused uh, about indulgences, right? And there were often a number of days attached to an indulgence, if it was a partial indulgence. Um, so a partial indulgence might be worth, you know, a hundred days, you know, and it got confused and people began to think that what was being said is that you get a hundred days off purgatory, right? Um, really what was happening there is they were saying, you know, if you do this indulgence, it's, you know, whatever effect it has in purgatory is equivalent to the effect of if you had done a hundred days of penance here. In, on earth during your life, you know. I hope that made sense uh, as I was explaining it. So, you know, yeah, so purgatory, right, the life after death is sort of beyond this material world and therefore beyond time. Uh, so, so we're, you know, we need to make sure we don't have, um, you know, that sort of getting into our concept. Uh, we don't quite understand how the duration of it's going to going to work if there is a duration at all, right? What we know is that there is an encounter with our Lord Jesus Christ, in which we see ourselves for, for who we truly are, and and we desire that purification that we need, uh, and and it's like you know apparently based on the visions of the saints, it is not pleasant to say the least, but but there is a desire for it, there is a thirst for that purity. Uh, this has gone longer than I expected, but uh, maybe I should have expected that since it is a a. Um, uh, complicated and difficult uh, doctrine in some ways. I hope I've been able to shed light on that, especially through the uh, this section in the encyclical. You are always welcome to email me questions. Um, and um, actually, I should uh, tell you what my email address is for those who don't have it. It is frbolso at sthenry.org. I was going to try to write it out real quick, but I'll just say it again, and you can you know pause the video and write it down. F R B as in boy, U L S O at S T Henry dot org. Um, so feel free to email me questions. We're going to continue, even though we finished the letter. This this actually was originally the last day for Coffee with the Clergy on the schedule, but I'm having too much fun to quit, and I think uh, y'all are with me. So we're going to keep going through the end of May. I don't know exactly what we're going to talk about next. I'm going to try to figure that out. I uh, I got a couple ideas rattling around. I want to make it something about prayer since we're in the, in the year of prayer. If you have any ideas or desires, feel free to send those my way. My initial thought for next week maybe was to look at uh, the Enneagram and its impact on, uh, its potential impact on someone's spiritual life. Uh, for those of you who've never heard of it before, the Enneagram is a personality type indicator. You know, think Myers-Briggs um, or something like that. Uh, but it's... Um, it's a very particular one, and I've come to very much appreciate it in the last probably couple years. Um, so anyways, uh, again, a little bit sad to see the encyclical go. Definitely, um, if you have questions, we can come back and, and open things up and, and try to clarify. But um, good, well, let's, let's close with a prayer for this session. And we'll turn, especially in this month of May, to our, to our mother, our Blessed Mother, asking for her prayers, uh, that we may truly have an increase of hope in our hearts, a hope that, as we have seen, uh, is not just about ourselves, but that extends to others. It's not just about forgiveness, it's also about justice, right? And hope in that, that final um, revealing and fulfillment of everything in the world. And so we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Stay healthy, stay hopeful, and we'll see you in the next video. God bless you.